Welcome to the Washington Heights Church Podcast. We're so glad you're here. Each week, we bring you the latest Sunday message filled with God's Word to help strengthen your faith and deepen your walk with Christ. Whether you're tuning in from home, your commute, or anywhere in between, we're thrilled to have you join our community. So grab a cup of coffee, find a cozy spot, and let's get started. Hey, I want to introduce you to somebody today. Usually, he is back in that tech cave back there. Um, But if you wonder, you know, who does all these incredible videos that we see and records all that stuff and puts it together and allows people to watch online and a whole lot more, it's this guy. His name is Sean, and he's one of the key players around here. Thanks, man. And he hates being in the spotlight. So we did that to him today. That's just how we roll. Now, let me uh, start us off today with a new series that we are beginning. And we're calling it Mountaintop Experiences. And it is these dramatic encounters that you find throughout the Bible. They're spaced out. And we're going to look at a series of several of them over the next several weeks. It's going to take us right up to Easter Sunday, which is at the end of March. And there are things that happened in those encounters that are so relevant still to life and faith today. And I'll be honest, as we look at this story today, this is one of those stories that is difficult. And it's difficult for people outside of faith, like seriously, the God of the Bible would ask that. It's difficult for people inside of faith. People have been around for a long time, like, yeah, that doesn't maybe sound like the God that I know. But you know what? We're going to walk through this, and I think we're going to see that there is something incredibly personally relevant in this story. Let me start with an image, though, that I think is going to help us get prepped for understanding what's going on. So a wheel with some spokes and a hub in there. And if you imagine your life sort of like that wheel and the spokes are the things that make up your life. And so maybe, you know, you, you think about your mom and you think about your dad. And then later in life, you know, you think about your spouse and then you think about a child and you think about your career. And there's all these different spokes that make up our lives, but what is the hub? What is the center? And when we think of that in spiritual terms, we might think, well, I'll just add God onto a spoke. But really, we were made so that God would be the hub, so that God would be the center. And everything else in our life works really well when we've got that center correct and right. Now, in the Bible, you might be familiar with the Ten Commandments. What's the first one? The first commandment is, you shall have no other gods before me. And you go, okay, well, I think I'm in good shape there because I haven't bowed down to a wooden statue, you know, anytime recently, so I'm okay with that. That's not all that it means. That can be one expression of it. But to have another god, small g, another word for that is idolatry. What does that mean? That means anything or anyone that we trust more than God. That's an idol. The Bible says this in the New Testament, that even greed is idolatry, right? We can put stuff in that hub position, that center position. And when we do that, it kind of throws a lot of the other things off kilter because all of a sudden we're looking to something or someone that was never created to occupy that position in our lives. Jesus talks about it this way in the New Testament. He's asked one day, what is the greatest commandment? And his answer is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? That's that hub piece. And then he says, and the second one is just like it. It doesn't sound like it, but it's just like it. He says, and love your neighbor as yourself. And it's almost as if there Jesus gives us this same sort of image that we can love others best, the spokes, when we love God the most but it's important that we get that centerpiece right. Here's a real simple way of, you know, illustrating this. So it was about three months ago and I walked out, you know, from back there getting ready for the first service and somebody looked at me and goes, "Um, you're out of kilter. I'm like, what? And they said, look at your shirt. I had misaligned my buttons. So my shirt was like this. 
And I said, well, thank you for that, right? And I think, you know, it helps us to understand that if you get the first button right, all the others fall in place. But you get the first one wrong, everything else is out of alignment, right? And it's that same sort of deal with what is at the center of our lives. You should have no other gods before only. We were made for God and for him to be the center. There are plenty of other things that make up our lives. There are plenty of spokes. But we need to know what's in the center and what role they play. So with that sort of image in our minds, let's jump into this story. It's found in the book of Genesis. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. Now, when it says sometime later, I think we got to back up and really understand what came before that. Because sometime later is about 10 chapters worth in the book of Genesis. And here's where Abram's story begins. In Genesis chapter 12, the world is a mess. It's ugly. And so God shows up, and instead of just turning away from it, God is now going to go to work to begin to redeem and to restore the world. Well, how's he going to do that? He comes and he chooses one person, one man, and his wife. And he comes to Abram at the time. He's going to change his names, and sometimes I might forget and go Abram or Abraham, um, but that's just the way it goes. And here's Genesis chapter 12. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all the people of the earth will be blessed through you. So now God is going to go to work. And what does he say? I'm choosing you. Why did he choose Abram? You know what? Because that was God's decision. And he invites him to take a pretty big step, right? Leave everything that you know and everybody that you know and go to this land. I'm going to show you. How will I know I'm there? I'll let you know when you get there. My wife won't even get in the car with me if she didn't know where we're going. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) And they're leaving everything behind and going, and God says, I'll let you know when we get there. And you know what? They do. It's an amazing step of faith. You know how old Abram is when this happens? 75 years old. And he gets up, leaves everything he knows, and trusts God. A little bit later, God renews that agreement, that covenant, that promise with him. And Abram has this incredible response. You know, look at the stars in the sky and you're going to have more descendants than that. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it. God credited it to him as righteousness. How are we made right with God? Belief is how that happens. And okay, God, you're going to make me the father of many nations, right? All right, I'm 75. I'm not even the father of one child, much less a nation. But God says, trust me. And he does. And so when we trust God, things happen right away, right? Well, not exactly. Abram waits 24 years after that. And then God shows up when he's 99 and says, this time next year, you will have a son. You have a son of promise. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac. That's going to be his son, whom Sarah will bear to you by this time next year. And Abram says, I believe you. And man, you would think that's the greatest test of his life, right? A quarter of a century of trusting God. But that was just the midterm. And the final exam is coming. Because that's what we pick up in Genesis 22. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. And he said to him, Abraham. We're clued in right up front in this story that this is a test. What do tests do? Tests um, don't show, you know, how much we can learn in that moment, right? You don't go to take a test, even in school now. Okay, I'm going to learn a lot by taking a test. No, a test reveals what's already there. And this is a test that's going to reveal something very important. It's going to reveal what is the center, what is the hub of Abraham's life, and what is a spoke. And there can be some really good things that make up our lives that can occupy that center position. And maybe the principle goes something like this, that even a good thing can become a God thing. Notice a small g. It's something or someone that we trust more than God. 
And that can happen. And that's what this test is about. So God comes to him and says, um, Abram, and Abraham answers. Here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son whom you love. By the way, that's the first time in the Bible the word love shows up. And it's in a relationship between a father and his miracle promised child. And he loves him dearly. So take the son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain. I will show you. What? That sounds strange to anybody. Now, at the time, there are a lot of pagan nations around, and child sacrifice and human sacrifice is a pretty common thing, actually. We find out later in the Bible that God says, we're not going to do that. And God is never going to ask for a human sacrifice as an act of worship. But you know what? We're not in that place where those boundaries have already been set. Remember, this is a test And God is going to reveal something. It's a one-time test. And so what do you do in response to that, right? God has showed up. You've been walking with him for a quarter of a century. And now you're asked to do something that's not only, you know, just over the top, but also something that seems to contradict. Well, didn't you say that my son was going to be the way through which you were going to form a nation and now you're asking me to sacrifice him? There is this conflict between the direction of God and the promise of God. And what do you do in those moments? What do you do? Here's what Abram did. Early the next morning, Abram got up and loaded up his donkey. His response is obedience. And I'll tell you, the moral of this story is not going to be, hey, no matter how ridiculous anything is that God asks you to do, just saddle up your donkey. The takeaway of the story is something a lot deeper than that. Sometimes our greatest test is our greatest gift. And in Abraham's life, his son in his old age was his greatest gift. And also the mark of God's promise. But there's also a God who's given him a direction. And in those moments when it seems like the direction of God contradicts the promise of God, I think there's a question we can ask ourselves in that moment. Is God a consultant or is he a king? You know what a consultant is, right? We've had some of those over the years. And people come in and they give you some ideas and then they get on a plane and leave. I think that's a great job if you can find it. You know, it's like, hey, I'm not responsible for any of it. I'm just going to give you some ideas. And then my plane leaves at five o'clock this afternoon. And, you know, that's just awesome. Must be nice. You know what a king is? King is the one with authority. King is the one to whom we bow. And on this day, Abram says, you're the king. You're the king. And so I will follow you. Story goes on. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Now, if this story is going to play out the way that it sounds at the beginning, and he's going to follow through with what God had asked him to do, isn't it interesting that he says, yeah, we're going to go over there, plural, but then wouldn't you think he would say, and I'll come back? But he says, no, we will go, and we will come back. There is hope and expectation, even in the middle of not knowing how this story ends for him right now. It's also the first time in the Bible that you see the word worship. What does worship mean? Sometimes we, you know, limit it and we say, well, it's the music part of a service. Well, it includes that, but it's more than that. We may think, well, it's the whole service. It includes that, but it's bigger than that. We may think it's when we go and serve someone. You know what? It includes that, but it's bigger than that. At its highest level, you know what worship is? Surrender. Surrender to God. Do you know why it is that some people put their hands up, you know, when we're singing? I don't know about you. I grew up in a church that was really out of place. We kind of put our hands in our pockets, you know, where we were. 
Somebody might call 911, you know, if we had our, our hands up there. But you know what that is? It's kind of a sign of surrender. It's a way of just signifying to God, surrender. God, I worship you. I surrender to you. And in this moment, that's what Abraham has in mind to do. And I believe, Abraham speaking, we're going to go and we will come back to you. You know what's happening? Intention at the same time in the story is trust and obedience. And he holds those things in tension and continues the journey with God. It was a three-day journey. Do you think there was any time to talk himself out of this? Well, maybe I misunderstood, and this is more of a spiritual sort of metaphorical kind of thing. Now Abraham's going, but he also believes we're going to go, and then we will come back. Abraham reasoned, we're told this in the New Testament, way after the fact. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive um, Isaac back from death. Think about this. What we know all these years after Jesus' life and death and resurrection, Abraham didn't know any of that. But he believed in advance that the God that he has come to know could even raise people from the dead. And if I follow through, I will go back with my son because God can do even that. So, Abram took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abram replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? We're not given any insight into emotions, but I think anybody who is a parent and who's not a parent would know what the anguish of that moment is like. Abram answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told them about, Abram built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Now let me give you a little detail about this story at this point. Remember I said when um, God showed up to Abram at first, he was 75 years old. They waited 25 years and then Isaac was born and now it's sometime later. And we don't know exactly the age here, commentators, I've seen anything from Isaac being 13 years old to being 37 years old and something in between there. But we're not exactly told. But here's the thing. When I read this story before, I'm kind of picturing, you know, a kid in pull-ups, you know, who's being carried up the hill there. But this is, at the very least, a teenager and is a hundred and something year old father. So let me ask you this question. If a teenager wanted to run away from this situation, can a 13-year-old outrun a 113-year-old? Yeah. Can a 13-year-old win a wrestling match against his 113-year-old father at this point? Yeah. I mean, you dads know what this is like, right? Kids want to wrestle you when they're growing up, and you're like, I can take them, I can take them, I can take them. The years go by. Then there's a day you're like, I don't think I can take them anymore. <laughs> let's not wrestle anymore. It makes your mom mad. So let's not do that, okay? We're going to break stuff, you know. But there's a day where you just can't take them anymore. And we often refer to this story as the faith of Abraham, and it definitely is that. But you know what it includes? The voluntary willingness of Isaac, the son, to lay himself on the wood. He trusts his father completely. And it's his story too. Then he, Abraham, reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God. This test has revealed, has shown, has demonstrated what's at the center. Was this a test to say, you know what? You just love your son too much. That's not what this test is. God is not asking us to love our children less or anyone in our lives less than we do. He's wanting us to love him more and to place him at the center. 
Because when we love him most, we love others best. And we love others best when we love him most. And sometimes we may put the gift in the hub position rather than the gift giver. But on this day, Abraham demonstrates, the test reveals that God is in the center. Now I know. Abraham looked up there and in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Well, what do you know? God provided a substitute who in this moment, this male sheep has its head in thorns. Keep that image in your mind for a moment. And so after the sacrifice, Abram called the place the Lord will provide. Right, what is the name of the mountain? It's not the mountain of radical obedience. It's the mountain of the Lord will provide. That God would do what he could. And to this day it is said on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. And Abraham's test is over. And this story stands all by itself, but I'll also tell you this, this story is a preview. It's a preview of something that the God who stands apart from time saw in this moment and even from eternity past to eternity future. Well, what is that? A thousand years go by after Abraham and Isaac are on that mountain. And there's a king in Israel, his name is David. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 3, it tells us that he buys a little piece of property and he builds an altar there and makes sacrifices to God. You know where it is? Moriah. It's on this same mountain. David's son, whose name is Solomon, winds up building a temple to God where sacrifices are offered over and over again. You know where it is? It's on this same mountain. Another thousand years go by, and you know what? Somebody else walks up Mount Moriah. And he is a one and only son. The New Testament tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Greatly loved. And he carried the wood, his cross, up a hill. And he voluntarily laid himself down on the wood. And his head was encased in thorns. Only on that day, there would be no angel calling out to stop. On that day, the knife fell. And on that day, God's love was on full display. Paul leans into that in the book of Romans. He says, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? So there's a loved son, carries the wood, voluntarily lays himself down on the very same mountain where Abraham and Isaac lived out their story. I think that helps us all these years later to really understand this. Now we know. Now we know the depth of God's love. How far would he go? That far. Now we know that it takes a substitute to stand in our place. It should have been us. But instead it was him. And now we know that it's God who provides. That the way that we're made right with the Holy God, it's not our doing, it's his. From beginning to end. And we can often think of the love of God as something that rolls off our tongue very easily and something that, you know, we can say so quickly. But I think that story powerfully illustrates in real terms what God did so that people like you and me could be made right with the Holy God. Because that's what it took. 
And if we understand the anguish of what it would be like to be faced with that sort of a, a test, you know, God is a being. He's not a force. And he went through with that because that was our only hope. Our only hope. And three days later, he rose from the dead and he offers life to people who would put their hope and trust in him. That's how far the love of God would go for you. Would you bow your heads together with me? And just before I pray, could it be that you've never taken that step of faith and trust to put 100% of your hope for heaven, your hope for a relationship with God into what Jesus has done for us? That's how it begins. That's where it starts. And it begins by acknowledging just the truth about ourselves and our need for God to rescue us, for Jesus to be my substitute, the one who willingly laid himself down so that I could be spared. And it's asking God for forgiveness asking God to be made right with him. And remember, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. It's belief that makes us right with God. Lord Jesus, thank you for who you are and thank you for putting the heart of God on full display. And God, would you enlarge our vision, our understanding, the depth of which we comprehend what you have accomplished for us. And God, may we know that you are our last and our only hope. And I pray that you would draw us closer to you and that we would often be reminded of you being at the center of our lives. And God, many times in my life, to be honest, those things shift around a little bit, but God, would you just help us recalibrate and bring us back to where we need to be so that we can get all the other good things in life that you have given to us, that we can understand them properly and enjoy them completely. And so we thank you for who you are and for the eternal difference made in you. And we ask and pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope you enjoyed today's message. If you found this sermon meaningful, please subscribe, rate, and leave a review. Your support helps us reach more people and spread the word. Stay connected with us throughout the week by following us on social media, at Washington Heights Church on Facebook and Instagram, and by visiting our website at whc.faith. For more information and additional resources, check out the podcast description below. Thank you for joining us. See you next week.